Hello and welcome to Paranormal Versus with myself, Kel Ridley, and my co-host, Michael Koff. Um, and it's wonderful to have you back here again. Um, tonight we have a um, special guest, uh, <laughs> Heather Lee Landon. Um, she's a paranormal researcher, um, author, speaker, and co-host herself, uh, host herself on our podcasts. Um, so I'd like to introduce her and give her a warm welcome to the show. So I'd like to welcome you, Heather. Hello. Thank you for having me today. Hiya. Um, can you just give her a brief outline of what it is that you do and who you are and how you got into this? Okay. Um, basically, I started getting into the paranormal field when I was 17. I started seeing my grandfather in our house and had no clue why he was there because back in the 80s, it was the place was only haunted if the person died there. And he hadn't died there. He didn't even live in that house. We moved there long after he had passed. And so the more research I did, of course, you know, I fell down that rabbit hole and just kept going. And even though I stayed behind the scenes for many years doing research and helping teams with their research of locations, um, I didn't really get active to where I went out and did, um, full, I guess you would say full time, because this is what I do full time between writing and co-hosting and everything um, for about five or six years now. And just kind of, you know, I, like I said, I do a lot of research. I've written uh, two books right now with History Press that have just released. Uh, I have another one coming out later this year and a long list of books that I'm writing with them. Um, I do speaking engagements. I was at Phantasm last year here in Orlando, have several other places that I'll be going to, um, a college tour is coming up as well. And I just, my goal with this field is to kind of I really want to make it a real science. I really don't like the fact that it's called a pseudoscience, but I get it. I completely understand why a lot of people call it that. So my ultimate goal is to help train people to have a better understanding of the paranormal, not to be afraid, and to kind of make everybody, not make everybody, but encourage everybody to kind of think for themselves in this field. Um, just because yeah. someone does it X, Y, and Z, you can try X, Y, and Z, but it might not work for you. You know, A, B, and C might work better for you. Wow, that's amazing. Um, so I just uh, sorry, Michael. I was saying that's a good point. That yeah, yeah, yeah. Not everybody's uh, different. Of course, yeah. Um, speaking about your qualifications and stuff like that. Um, so what is a, a certified researcher, and how do you become one? Okay, well, I had attended Institute of Metaphysical and Humanistic Studies. It's uh, based here out of Clear uh, Clearwater, Florida. Dr. Kelly's amazing. It's a secular school. It's uh, tied to St. St. Francis, St. Francis University, mm -hmm. I think, or St. Thomas University, one of the two. I can't remember the secondary school that he's tied to, but he has the metaphysical school where they do um, secular degrees. They teach everything from religious studies to life coaching. He has a paranormal track that you can go through. And with that, you take a whole bunch of courses, including there was two courses that were tied together for the uh, certified paranormal investigator. And that's just basically the Institute's way of saying this person has taken the class. We have validated that they understand everything that goes into being a paranormal investigator. And it's, you know, it's kind of just like backing up that, yes, we did take the, you know, thing, the same thing with the certified EVP technician, several classes went into that. You study, you learn a whole bunch of different ways on how to analyze EVPs, you know, traditional ways, unconventional ways how to capture EVPs, how to encourage EVPs to come out. And that certification is just, again, basically the Institute's way of saying, yes, this person went through this. They have the extra training and the knowledge to uh, conduct a thorough research and investigation. Wow. Well, that's pretty amazing. So I'm kind of curious. What well, you mentioned a lot of the courses like you would take for the EVP. What would be some of the courses in the paranormal investigator track? That one taught us everything. Um, there was a course in there that was um, forensic studies. So we learned everything from how to seal off, I mean, seal off an investigation scene, even though, you know, similar to a crime scene, how, you know, and it even went into how to capture imprints of, um, you know, like say Bigfoot's feet, you know, in footprints. Then we also had how to preserve, you know, chain of command. Um, and everything, you know, processes. And then it also went into um, client cases on how to talk to clients and how to, you know, keep them calm and, you know, help them from point A to point B. So that way they're not scared to be in their home anymore. Okay. So it sounds like it was like you're becoming a detective. 
type classes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's what you need in that. So, uh, getting into your, your paranormal stuff, um, so where's your favourite um, ghost town and why? My favourite ghost town? Um, Goldfield. Goldfield. <laughs> and that one is mostly because I'd been there several times to investigate. We, um, my family is my paranormal team, my husband and my son, and we were asked to do an investigation up in Goldfield for uh, Real Hans Ghost Towns, which came out two years ago. And it was a lot of fun. We went to the cemetery, the Goldfield Hotel, the high school. But prior to that, there's a mine there. And the mine's not operational anymore, but the owner opens it up for tours now and then. And we were the first paranormal team to go in. And we went in with a production crew because they wanted to film a pilot for a TV show. But of course, COVID hit and that got shelved. But being able to go down in the mine and actually conduct an investigation underground was such an amazing feeling that I absolutely fell in love with the town, the history. And it's such a cute town. If I could have afforded to live in the middle of nowhere, <laughs> I, I, I would have loved to have lived there. And um, for the people that's in the UK, whereabouts is that? What state is it in? Uh, it's in Nevada. It's probably, I would say, about three hours north of Vegas. Right. Brilliant. Michael? Um, so in reading your bio, you talk about, you know, teaching courses and magic. And you have a paranormal team, I think, that you founded that's got magic based in it by the title, mm -hmm. I'm guessing. So what type of magic do you bring on your investigations to help? Um, for me, I, I guess you would say I'm an eclectic witch. I pick and choose what works for me, which is I always tell everybody, you know, even with the different life coaching courses that I do, you know, do what works for you. So, but when it comes to an actual investigation, I did uh, found um, with a friend of mine, the Witches Paranormal Society, and that's just more of our way of teaching the next generation of paranormal investigators on how to use witchcraft in their investigations. So when we go to investigations, I use everything from, um, you know, the pendulums, the uh, I don't use the Ouija boards, not that I have anything against them because I use a pendulum board instead. For me, they're easier to transport um, dousing rods. Um, I use unconventional tools. I don't use, um, I mean, of course we have a spirit box, but you have that because if you host an event, the people want to hear what's going on. They don't want to have to wait till you send them the audio later. Um, I use fidget spinners. I know that's not really witchcraft wise, but I love my fidget spinners on investigations. And it mostly is that we want to take an approach to help empower our clients. Um, so if they, you know, believe in themselves and we can give them certain tools, like I'll give um, clients herbal bath bags, uh, crystals, um, we'll cleanse the home, I'll help cleanse the home with uh, cascaria, you know, and if, the, if they're Catholic, I have them follow behind me and I use the cascaria first, then they follow behind me with the holy water. And it's all, you know, when it comes to witchcraft and pagan, it's all about empowering the person to do it. And that's what I try to bring to every investigation. All right. So just for clarification with everybody that's watching, because I know witchcraft has a tendency to everybody misnomer it to, oh, they're doing spells and summonings. So you're not doing any of that part. No, no. Even though I know a lot of people who do that, um, that's not something I do because you never know what you're summoning. Um, I view the different spells that you do more or less for empowerment. So, you know, you're going to do a love spell and it's not so much that the spell works, but the spell will work if you and your heart and mind believe it works. Right. Okay. And so then up, oh, we got a hello from the chat group. Valley Spirit Communication says hello from California. Hello. <laughs> so... <laughs> When you're talking about using the magic and everything, and you know, you mentioned spells for empowering, are there any spells of protection that you use for yourself and your teams? Oh, yeah. I mean, there's always, you know, um, usually when I was on other teams, I was typically the odd man out. And of course, they would do all their rituals and pray. And for me, it's more or less, I just step outside, I barefoot. Um, find a grassy area or even dirt if there's no grass in the area. And I just kind of self-meditate 
for a while. Of course, you circle yourself with the white light. Then I also, I'm always laughed at when I come home because I have crystals in my pockets. I have, you know, everything from, you know, of course, the crystal quartz, the black tourmaline, um, sandstone, a whole bunch of different things. And then I also have little packets of herbs and rosemary, thyme, and marjoram are great protectors to have with you. Excellent. So what kind of crystal is your favorite for protection on the investigations? I actually use, it's um, a zebra stone and it's a calming stone. And it's also, you know, protecting because once you calm yourself down, you have the power to protect yourself. Brilliant. Excellent. All right. Well, Scott Matthewson has a question for you. He says, do you think there comes a point where spirit comes to trust and remember you? We have been focusing on a particular location and feel we have turned to that corner. Yeah, definitely. 100%. Um, just a quick story on that one. The one team that I was a part of back in Vegas, we uh, investigated the same location every month. That was where we did our team meetings and we did our team trainings. And um, I had one time I woke up in the middle of the night to a black shadow standing at the foot of my bed, warning me not to go back to the location. And we were supposed to go back in two days. And while I was there, um, during the investigation, it was the worst investigation we ever had. Um, we encountered several nasty spirits that were just being nasty, um, telling us to get out. You know, um, we've had a couple of investigators pushed during that investigation. But then after that, we never had that happen again. So I felt that that spirit was coming to warn me. And then COVID hit and we weren't going back to the place. And the same spirit, it was almost like they were coming to check on me. They were standing in the kitchen looking over me. And once they saw I was okay, they disappeared. Oh, that's pretty cool. So, Kel, do you have a question? Um, No, I think it's your question again next. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, well. So, in your bio, you mentioned that you were the former chief administrative officer for the Warren mm -hmm. Legacy Foundation. Mm -hmm. So, what was that like? In that position, I basically, I was um, in charge of helping keep the organization organized. Um, I set up training opportunities for members to learn more about different aspects of the foundation and the paranormal. I helped set up interviews for the founder so he could do um, help promote the foundation. I was working on setting up events because we we're in the process of trying to set up an actual, not really a paracon, but larger events than just your standard small events that you see popping up. And um I did their social media promotion as well. That's cool. So did you ever get to meet the Warrens at all? Unfortunately, no. I joined the foundation after, uh, I think it was about six months after Lorraine had passed. Right. Hmm. So what got you in interested in like haunted histories? It was one of those, I've always researched it. I've always wanted to know the location. Um, it, it's, I was the type of person, I when we go on vacations, like we'd go to Gettysburg, um, I'd be taking the uh, the haunted tours and then I'd be going to their local bookstore and buying up all the history books based on the locations we went to. Because I want to know not only that the place is haunted, I want to know the history and what from that history could be causing the paranormal activity in the location. Nice. Wow. So mentioning going along those lines of, because I understand that being history major background that there's always stories in the background have you ever been like say investigating Gettysburg and you know the history but then it's like you have you're witnessing or you're experiencing something that goes wait a minute this isn't what the history says and what do you do with that information you research more until you find something. Um, Cause one example is I was a, a photography student at the time in college. This was back when I was 20 and I was shooting a whole bunch of photos at devil's den. And it, we were there the weekend, I think it was 4th of July weekend. So they were doing a reenactment at Gettysburg for that weekend. And all of a sudden around the boulder, one of the boulders comes a um, Confederate soldier. And he walks by me, tips his hat and goes around the other corner of the boulder. I immediately, I'm like, I need to get this guy's photograph. So I started chasing after him. And when I turned the corner, he was gone. Wow. And I searched everywhere and I would have seen him running away and all the places that he would have ducked into 
he would have still been there because there was no other way out. So he was just gone. And it was one of those things where it was like, you know, that kind of piqued my interest because I didn't know too much about the Devil's Den area at that time. I just knew it was a major part of the battle. And it wasn't until recently because I just kept researching it. Um, recently, there was an article that was published and I wish I could remember who published it, but it had talked about the, um, it was the Confederate, uh, Mark Brady's, I was trying to remember his, or Matthew Brady's photo of the uh, Confederate sniper that was shot there. And it came out that they had found records that Matthew Brady's assistant um, had left records behind that he actually was instructed by Brady to get a body and stage that scene. So that body was never there. The sniper never really died there. And the body is they and they showed two photos side by side. The body is actually seen on the battlefield 70 yards away and at uh, Devil's Den. And the more I researched it and they finally figured out who the person was that the body that was there. And it just looks like the guy I remember seeing. Wow, that's pretty cool. So you also were part of a lot of projects. In your bio, you listed, I think there was like three or four of them. So what was or is, if you're still a part of them, your favorite project to be a part of? Oh, any of them. It's it's like picking your favorite child. <laughs> 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 I, I do have to say that I really enjoyed Touch of Magic. Um, I still, I haven't done any videos for them lately, but what I really liked about that is um, there was a whole bunch of us and, you know, throughout the country that got together and we would just create little eight minute videos that, you know, like I talked about, you know, different herbs and the different benefits and how to use them. So it was kind of, I had fun with that, but the biggest things that I really enjoy are my writing projects like the two books that just came out, one came out last fall and one just came out last week. And then I have the other one that goes off to the publisher tomorrow. And can you list the projects that you were a part of? Because I feel like we're mentioning stuff from your bio, but people will be like, well, but we don't see her bio. <laughs> So can you share some of those? So that let, let me know can... if I forget anything. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, of, of course, you have um, it's the Real Hans Ghost Towns with motion picture video, and then Real Hans Three just came out earlier this year. Uh, both are available free on Tubi. Um, we were filmed by the uh, production company. Um, great, amazing people. They also filmed in Real Hans Three four other teams across the country, where Real Hans Ghost Towns was just my team. And then um, I'm Mystic University. I'm in the process. I've actually all my courses have just come down because I'm in the process of updating and revamping them. But hopefully by the end of March, they'll be back up. And with um, I'm Mystic University, it's everything from my friend Marissa, who's known as the Sin City Witch. She teaches everything from Witchcraft 101. There's a crystal class on there. There's a Reiki class on there you can take to learn more about Reiki. And she has me there to teach um, the paranormal and then also to teach how to use witchcraft with the paranormal. Um, of course, Touch of Magic, which is also run by uh, the Sin City Witch um, and which is paranormal. Um, I <laughs> partnered with her. We've done a few things on that, but she's had some issues. So we've put that temporarily on hold, but that hopefully will be back. Um, I'm trying to think. Oh, um, I also co-host Ghost Education 101 with Philip Wyatt. We've been doing that for since COVID started. It's a uh, two-hour show every other Wednesday night on uh, Paralanx. Oh, you could also find it on at Ghost Education 101 on Facebook. And that one, we do a whole bunch of different things. We Like last night, we had a presentation from the Haunted Librarian. She uh, showed um, different slides based on haunted crime scenes and talked about the different history behind those crime scenes. Next week, we're doing a panel discussion on para unity and uh, team conduct. We also do um, where we just interview different people on the show. And it's basically just an open forum where we talk about all things paranormal in the hopes of being able to get correct information out to the people because there's so much false information out there. And again, we always tell people, believe what you want, but here's the information that we believe is true. And we pass that on to everybody. And then I also started hosting a show last fall on WLTK DB Radio, Exploring the Paranormal. It's every Tuesday morning from 10 a.m. to noon. 
And on there, I have guests where we talk about everything from the science and the paranormal to, you know, metaphysical approaches, um, everything from, you know, I have witches on there. I have Catholic priests on there. And I just basically try to interview anybody who's part of the paranormal on that show. Wow. And I thought two podcasts a month was too much. <laughs> How do you find time to do all of that? <laughs> Don't ask. <laughs> like I said, I do this full time. <laughs> wow. That's wow. amazing. Um, we've got a question in the chat. Um, Scott Matthewson says, is there anywhere in Scotland you'd like to visit or investigate? And this is for the whole panel. So we'll ask you that first, Heather. My, and it would be Scotland or Ireland, either one is um, my dad had always talked about how he wanted to go pub to pub riding a bike and grab a beer at every pub. I would love to do the same thing, but conduct an investigation at every pub as I go. Yeah. Ooh, I think that's I'd just like a normal party. Friday night in England. Right. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Um, Michael? Uh, for me to visit, I would say the Highlands of Scotland and... Maybe, oh man, this, I'm so going to get dogged for this. I can't, Inverness. I couldn't remember the name of the city, but Inverness. Mm -hmm. And the Circle of Stones at those. I don't think they're actually in Inverness. I think it's actually in another location. Are you talking about off Outlander? They're not actually I there. Am. No, they were, yeah. they were built. They're not actually there. They don't exist. <laughs> I think they actually exist in another spot. I think. I found um, they were. No, I think they were of... actually built I, I, when I looked into it a while ago because I wanted to go and see them and it says they don't exist. They were just actually made for the film, the, the program. Ah. I could be wrong, but that's what I read anyway. Oh, see, this is what we're talking about <laughs> false truths. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. But um, to investigate, I would say the tunnels under Edinburgh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, for me, the, it would have to be yeah, definitely Edinburgh um, or um, Culloden Battlefield. I'd like to go investigate there as well. Definitely cool. Culloden. Yeah. Right. right. Um, um, you you said obviously you into witchcraft, Heather. Well, obviously into witchcraft. <laughs> You're a witch. <laughs> Um, so what what kind of witchcraft do you do? Because the, these days there's that many. There's like obviously kitchen witch, green witch, um, a paganism. What, what kind would you class yourself as? If I had to categorize it, I would say it's a com more of a combination of kitchen and green because right. I, I love the herbs um, and I love, you know, of course, I come up with a whole bunch of different brews to do on the stove to make the house smell good or, you know, to put intentions out there in the air. So yeah. those would be the two closest, but I still do as much research and much learning from anybody I can. Mm -hmm. um, and if something I think would work for me, that's something that I would start using. Right. Cool. Michael, any so, more questions? Uh, one that's kind of piqued my interest that I'm glad I get a chance to ask is, <laughs> what is self possession and how do you describe and know when that's happening um i it's actually i'm hoping to finish a book on that soon um but i believe i truly wholeheartedly believe in the power of self-possession and with that aspect is um i'm try, i always try to figure out how to word it so i don't uh, offend anybody <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's one of those things where if you are truly self-possessed in the aspect of you wholeheartedly believe in yourself, you believe in your powers, you believe in your abilities, um, you be just believe in anything you can do, nothing else can possess and overtake you. It's And I mean, I know it's probably not the best analogy, but you're looking at, let's say, if you're if you have any self-doubt or any, you know, self-questioning, you leave yourself open to be picked on ridiculed and i'm not blaming the victim at all it's i want to try to you know of course we need to stop the bullies out there but if you're fully confident in your skills and yourself you're less likely to be harassed because the people that do look for that harassment and to cause the problems look for those who are weaker and i know that's bad to say and like i said i'm not meaning to offend anybody with that but that's the best analogy i can come up with and it goes the same way with paranormal the spirits and the demons look for the weakest person. You know, of course they try to take out the most strong person, but they look for the weakest person mentally 
um, to try to take over and to cause harm to. Well, I'm glad I asked because I was thinking along the lines of going into trans state. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. So, um, where, where have you investigated? Oh, um, most of my actual investigations were out in the Vegas area. Um, of course, we did a cute little museum. I fell in love with it. It's called Nakaw School of Mines. And we also, we also featured them in Real Hunts Ghost Towns, if anyone ever wants to see what this little place looks like. And I volunteered there. And um, it's an above ground simulated mine. And it's uh, once you walk through that front cave entrance, you feel like you're underground, even though you're still above ground. It was created by the guy who did the Indiana Jones ex um, shows and exhibitions at Disney. And then they also have a whole bunch of mining equipment throughout the area. You feel like they have, you know, the car, they have a car from Area 51 there, which we had high EMF readings on that one. But then you go to the second car in the train and there's no EMF readings. It's just flatlined. So very, very interesting place. And one day I said, hey, you know, let, let's, you know, see if you have any ghosts after I got done volunteering. And, and they did. <laughs> so that's one of my favorite places. Um, I had been trying to think. I did several residentials out there, um, a couple museums, but unfortunately I can't name them due to non-disclosure agreements that we had to sign before that. Um, up in Goldfield, you have the Goldfield Hotel, um, the Florence Mine, um, the Goldfield Emporium when it was still open, the cemetery in Goldfield. And that is it for Goldfield. And then I went to Gold Point and we did an investigation inside the bar as well as by the hangman's noose in the middle of the street. And in Nelson, Nevada, we went down into a mine, an abandoned mine shaft there as well. Oh. Have you so, done any investigations international? No, no, but I did when we went to Puerto Vallarta, there was this cute little church. And when I went into the church, I took a whole bunch of photos and I definitely was not alone. <laughs> wow. Wow. So, um, what's your scariest um, investigation that you've or encounter that you've ever had? Um, I would say one would be a residential, because it was the first time that I had ever been physically harmed. You wow. know, I always knew that there were stories that you know ghosts could harm you, but I was. We actually had done the whole investigation earlier in the investigation. Um, the partner that I was with in one of the rooms, he all of a sudden lost time. His face went blank and his eyes turned black. And I was like, oh crap. So I'm in my head counting down from 30. And I'm like, if he doesn't snap out of this, I'm getting him out of here. But he snapped out of it. And he's like, what happened? He had no idea where he was anymore. He completely lost it. And then later that night when we were, I was doing a quick cleansing of the home, I was, she had this big bay window over her um, garden tub. And I was, you know, doing some cleansing around that window and something swept my feet out from underneath me, almost like a karate swipe. Wow. And I flew up in the air, landed on my knees and, and it scared me, but the mother in me, I instantly stood up and started yelling at it. I'm like, we don't do that. You don't, <laughs> that's not how we treat people. And after I did that, the house got brighter and it was just very interesting. And then the only other time that I was actually really scared, scared, scared was I was at the Florence mine. We investigated a collapse section of the mine. And something told me to go all the way back to where the rubble was. And I, hand, crawling on my hands and knees, getting all the way back there, uh, started an EVP session, but I couldn't continue. I started crying. Um, I felt like I was being crushed. I couldn't breathe. Um, I started hearing men screaming, um, cries. And then I just, it was like, I felt like I was being crushed under the rubble. Luckily, um, the because we were there with a documentary crew, they followed and one of the guys followed and he got me out of there. And once I was five feet away from that collapsed area, I was perfectly fine. It was like nothing happened. But while I was back there, I thought I was dying. Have wow. you been back? No, no, we haven't had a chance to go back there yet. We're hoping. <laughs> okay. Well, Scott in Scotland has another question for you, which I think is actually a good one. In America, do you find the more ha hype a location has, the less activity there is? 
Yeah, I would say it's not so much the hype. I would say um, the more it's investigated. There's a lot of locations that I know there was one location that we went to that was investigated like by every team in town and there was no activity. And I truly do think that sometimes at this point in time, the spirits are like, oh, crap, here comes another team. (laughs) (laughs) And and they just don't want to participate anymore. (laughs) Yeah, and they're probably like, they're going to ask us the same questions. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> who are you <laughs> so um do you see a difference between ghosts and spirits yes and no i mean it's there's still you know there were once people too <laughs> and i know there's a whole bunch of different definitions on you know a ghost is a ghost that's stuck here and a spirit is someone that's crossed over and has returned i mean I, i'm not one big on labels it's you know it's not a living person anymore is how i view it and other than that i really i don't see a difference whether they've crossed over or they're stuck here cool so nicola has a question for you Uh, actually for all of us is what sets you apart from other investigators oh that's a good one Mm -hmm. do you want to go first tara I was going to say, who wants to go? I can go first. (laughs) Um, I would say two different things. One is, well, I guess you could say three and I'll make them as quick as possible. Um, The first one is, is I don't hide any of my evidence or any of my, anything I get. Unless I sign a non-disclosure agreement, I'm open. I'll share it. Um, I'm willing to train other investigators. I'm really willing to mentor. Um, I'm not, I'm just not, I'm not a, evidence hoarder, I guess you would say. It's like, no, you can't see my evidence. (laughs) And I'm always willing to help people, you know, find the next uh, place to investigate. I also, when I'm actually on the investigation, I like to open it up by telling the spirit, hey, I'm here to talk to you. You know, do you have any questions for me before we get talking? I would love you to know me better. And then I just go sit in the corner of the room for about 15, 20 minutes with a digital voice recorder running, just in case anyone, you know, wants to talk from the other side. Uh, more or less, that's my way of getting them to uh, open up to me or to understand that, you know, they can ask me questions too. And I guess it was only two because I lost track of my third one. <laughs> cool. Michael? All right. Oh, I was going to say, Kel, you can take it. <laughs> no, I'll let you. <laughs> so I would say one of the things that sets me apart is... I go at it having fun and professional at the same time. And so, and another part is I grew up in the metaphysical side, not really the dogmatic. So I'm more open and aware of things. And so I bring that as well. And, and, I'm becoming more open and public about that because growing up in the Bible Belt, that was something that you didn't discuss. So I'm slowly working that back in and becoming more public. And it's harder, too, because when I can say I can sense a spirit's here, I can feel it, sense it. But then everybody says on every, like, camera or every piece of equipment says no there's nothing here it's like i know there's something here i can't prove it in that aspect but i know and so that's part of the other fun of what i bring is because it's like yeah i get to challenge the equipment a little bit and having a history background you know that kind of helps yeah um, that's why I was going to say about me. It's um, I'm a historical researcher, so that is my forte. It's I always delve into places where some people can't do. Um, and like I say, when it comes to the history of the paranormal, I, I look in everything. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I do have some experiments on that that my team have that nobody else has that were obviously invented by Drew Bartley. Um, so. Like I say, that that's the only thing I can think of that sets me apart at the moment. But. All right, let's see. 
Uh, Scott's just, I think, making a comment. Or yeah. Oh, no, he does have a question in there. Uh, no worries about all the questions, Scott. We appreciate it. It says, over here, we have lots of teams that just label everything paranormal rather than try debunking. <laughs> What's the panel's thoughts on this? He's just inquisitive. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's, I, that, I think that comes from the fact that if you're helping clients, you, they automatically call you and say, you have a, that, you know, I'm, I need help. I have a demon. And it's like, well, if you're saying you have a demon, chances are you don't. Um, <laughs> and there's so many teams out there that are still in the learning process because there, there's been in the last, just last two years, a boom in the number of teams that are out there. And I think that a lot of them are learning from TV shows and nothing against the TV shows. They're you know, a great place to get some basic information. But, you know, you, people don't realize that these shows <clears throat> film for two to three weeks to get 30 minutes worth of evidence. So um, they're and they're also I over eager. I, I think that those who wholeheartedly believe in the paranormal with no skepticism whatsoever are um, almost as bad as someone who's a hundred percent skeptical and there's no way there's paranormal because they go in wanting paranormal activity to happen so bad that nine times out of 10, they might self manifest it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so for me, I would say I like to try and debunk it because to me, if I can't debunk it, that makes it more even relevant and more like, wow, this really is paranormal. So it's like, to me, it's the other side of the coin of it eliminates all doubt and questioning in myself. Did I really catch this? Because if I can't duplicate it, then that's definitely something caught. And so, and another thing that I like to, think about when I'm going into things is like whenever somebody feels like something like low or they call bad energy, it could just be as, you know, a spirit just not happy with what's going on. But when everyone starts calling it a demon, you know, let's look at, I like to say, look at society. If we call somebody, you know, that doesn't quite grasp something stupid, over and over, they start to think of themselves as stupid. Well, spirits, I feel, are the same way. If we come in and we're constantly saying, oh, my gosh, you're giving off a bad energy, you're a demon, they're going to start acting like it because that's what we're calling them. Mm -hmm. And they're just getting fed up with saying, no, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's the other reason why I... I'm not saying, you know, don't attack me for saying demons aren't out there because I'm sure they are. I just feel there are several times where it may be misidentified. It may just be a, like, for an example is there's a spirit at Old Park Hotel that's of a lawman turned outlaw who was a brutal killer. And I'm sure that energy carries over into the next, you know, part of his journey. And so, yeah, we may think of it as demonic, but that's just his nature. And so we're misidentifying. So that's my take on that part. Yeah. With um, me, the team that I was in um, a few years ago um, with Drew Bartley in it, um, we're all, we were all members of the SPR, the Society of Cycle Research. So they do tell you to debunk everything and have evidence, um, like scientific evidence on everything. Check, like, obviously, if the door opens, make sure it's not air pressure and obviously stuff like that. So we were taught we, we had to debunk everything. So it's like we will... There was a video was sent to us a few years ago when I was on a different team, and basically there was a, what looked like a spirit pushing the gate shut. But when you look at it properly, it was just um, the wind caught a vent that came out of the heating system, and there was a puff of like mist came out, and basically the wind pushed that along. And the woman was adamant that that was paranormal, but 
fantasy, it wasn't. So, like I say, I tend to debunk as much as I can. It's possible anyway. All right. Well, Nicola has another question. I don't know if it's for everyone or just for you, Heather, but it's your thoughts on the UFO para, I'm assuming paranormal connection. That, that's interesting because um, in Vegas, we were two, two and a half hours from Area 51. So it was always a hot topic out there, um, especially with the Nevada Triangle, similar to the Bermuda Triangle. And I, I'm torn on it. I, I do believe that we have had visitors um, from another realm, whether it's out in space or they've managed to manifest some type of uh, portal where they can come into our world. And so it's one of those things where I do think they are connected because if they are using a portal, they might be something we see as a ghost when in fact they're an alien. And that might explain why we don't always interact with the same ghost because it's different aliens coming through that portal onto earth. All right. I agree with that. And Nicola corrected and said it's for all of us. So Kel. <laughs> I totally agree. Um, basically, I mean, what we perceive as being aliens, it, it could be the same, like I say, ghosts um, mm -hmm. could be them. Um, it's like there's some, um, I would say ghosts, that could come through portals and um, you see like shadow figures and stuff like that one minute they're there and one minute they're not so where do they where do they go to you know what i mean um it could be like obviously a different dimension um aliens as well um the way i see it is they come through different dimensions uh, they don't necessarily come through like thousands and millions of light years away mm -hmm. uh, they use wormholes they could be like yeah in a different plane that's it sounds stupid, I know. <laughs> well, that's the yeah. way I see it. So, yeah. What about you, Michael? Yeah, I, I chose to go last because this is a <laughs> hot topic of mine that I love to <laughs> talk about. Is So, when people talk about paranormal, they always assume it's spirits and ghost hunting. That's it. But the paranormal field actually is... Spirits, ghosts, ufology, cryptids, interdimensional, you know, portals, beans. It's a whole host of things. And I think that one of the things that goes on in the field is the disservice is everyone gets focused into one niche and forgets the rest. And so if it's not in their repertoire of what they're investigating, they discount it. And I think an example of that is when I um, went on a sky watching investigation, which turned out to be paranormal as well. And sky watching is you're looking in the sky for UFOs that I had a quartz crystal appear out of thin air, fall right behind me. And so the owner mm -hmm. said, the, the spirits or the beings there wanted me to have that crystal. So mm -hmm. that's why it was a gift for me. And a lot of people that I talked to in the paranormal field, they're like, oh, that's just weird. Or that sounds cool. And then they'll be like, okay, whatever. And I'm like, that that's just a legit paranormal experience. Mm -hmm. But because there's no ghost or spirits attached to it, they're like, no, that's not really paranormal. I'm like, yeah, it is. <laughs> so that that that's why I always say this is like a hot deal for me is I kind of get on a soapbox is because I feel like we always assume it's just a small portion and there's a whole bigger picture that everyone doesn't think about. And I feel like we really need to start bridging more. Yeah. It's like the link to people try and say, well, the people are saying there's a link to the UFOs and Sasquatch. Mm -hmm. So. I, you know, talking about that, I firmly believe that because of the fact we can get their footprints. 
we can catch them in blurred images, in which case I view that as they're entering their portal back to their home. And I was discussing this actually on our on my other show on Tuesday night, shameless plug. And <laughs> but I was it's like, terrible. you know, if we think about it, if they are interdimensional creatures and they're coming here, I'm like, you know, if they're on vacation coming here to this world to vacation, I would be seriously getting a new travel agent. <laughs> because it's not the safest place to go, you know, and uh, vacation right now. But, yeah, I mean, I, I definitely agree. they they got to be interdimensional or live in center of the earth because that's why there's no traces of their home or, like, a nesting area that we only ever see footprints or, like, debris of where they've been. That's my take. Yeah. All right. Have you, have you got so, any more questions there? Uh, actually, Scout has one for Heather. So you and I get to take a break, Kel. Yay. <laughs> oh, my swap. answer won't be long. <laughs> it says, Heather, have you ever visited the historic Scotts County Jail? I watched a program on it, found it really interesting. Yeah, I have not been to that one yet. Oh, well, that was really short. Like I said, really short. <laughs> Unfortunately, <laughs> I haven't been there. <laughs> um, can you tell us a little bit about what he's referring to? or To, to be honest, I, I don't know what it is. <laughs> okay. It's, I'm actually going to be adding that to my research list now. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually... Our show, Paranormal Versus, that Kel came up with is based on UK versus USA, like paranormal styles. Mm -hmm. And I saw in your bio that you talk about working with teams in the US and teams international. Do you what differences do you find in how the teams operate and investigate? Um the one biggest difference I found is um equipment is different. I know um, a lot of more of the international investigators that I've talked to, they use more old school equipment, um, non-tech tools. They're not into the latest and greatest gadget. And also some countries such as Spain, they have um, actual certifications that you have to get if you're going to do client cases. So, and in some countries, uh, paranormal investigations are more regulated where in the U.S. it seems like it's a free-for-all. Okay. Oh, well, Scott did some work for you. He said it's an old jailhouse where the jailer and his family lived as well. He is said to still be there. I'm going to definitely be putting that on my list. And, of course, I don't have a pen nearby. Go figure. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sure it'll come up again. Oh, yeah. But um, so one thing Kel and I were to, trying to figure out that you mentioned is Paranexus. Mm -hmm. What is Paranexus and what can you share about it? Um, that is basically from Dr. Kelly set that up for all of his graduates from uh, his degree program. And it's where we can all gather. We share ideas. We um, there's he has all of the different forms that you can use for different types of investigations. We have access to those so we don't have to save them on our computers if we don't want to. Um, and it, it's a great place because you have people who graduated this program 20 years ago versus people who are just now graduating the program. So you have a whole bunch of different perspectives on the paranormal. And what I like about it is um, different people who are doing active research studies will throw out a theory. And they'll be like, what's your thoughts on this theory? And everyone can help do the experiments on their own separate. And then we all come together and share those exper experiments and our results with each other and see who came up with what. So it's a great place to help advance the field scientifically. Wow. Oh, that sounds pretty cool. And yeah. Sounds like we got to take a course to get a part <laughs> of that. <laughs> 
Yeah, I don't know if he's opened it up publicly or not, but it's uh, everybody in there that I've seen, I know has gone through his program and has graduated. Uh, wow. that, that's really cool that he does that. So you mentioned that you have two teams, the Exploration Paranormal and co-founded the Witches Paranormal, or is it Witches Paranormal Society? Did you yeah, say? Witches Paranormal Society. So what drew you to finding those and co-founding? Um, well, for the Witches Paranormal Society, that's a faster answer. I'll start there. Um, my friend, like I said, the Sin City Witch, she um, had done several investigations with me. We helped with the, um, we put together the Las Vegas Pride, uh, or the Las Vegas Pagan Pride Festival out in Las Vegas, but it was canceled due to COVID, but her and I were on the committee to work that. And we just got chatting back and forth and she's like, you know, we do all this witchcraft stuff. And she goes, I know you're into the paranormal. She's like, why don't we do this? And I was like, oh, that's a great idea. But then shortly after we set it up, I moved to Florida and she had some issues that she had to take a break from the field for a while. So, and we're actually just back into talking about getting that going again. And for my team, what ended up happening is the team I was on, I still talked to a lot of the members, but there were some issues. Once it came out that I was a witch because I usually kept that to myself and a lot of the team members shunned me. Um, a lot of team members didn't want to investigate with me anymore, or at least it felt like that because they just never showed up whenever I was going to be there. Um, and then I also didn't like their method methods of investigating. So I left and I was just kind of doing it on my own. And my husband said to me, he's like, you really can't be going to clients' homes alone. You know, don't go investigate alone. You're not safe. So he started investigating with me and my son was always interested and he started joining us. So we decided to create our own family team and it was just the three of us. So how long has it been investigating with your family? Three years. So what is that like? Does it all, does it like, is your son ever like, no, mom, I don't want to do this. Oh, Why no. are you making me do this <laughs> at this No, location? I've always, I've always asked him, you know, hey, we're going to go do this. Do you want to go with? And he's like, sure. <laughs> That's cool. So, so he's always open for it. So what do you think it is about you being a witch that people don't seem to like? The term witch, people are afraid of it. Because right. they think it's all dark magic and, you know, conjuring <laughs> and all of that stuff. And it's not. Yeah. Yeah. So you mentioned that you teach paranormal. What is that like? Like, how, what's your style of teaching it? How do you teach it? Um, well, of course, I always have different slideshows based on whatever topic they want it. You know, if I do in-person teaching, if it's um, online classes, sort of the same, but just a little bit different based on uh, the platform we're doing it on. But I always open up, um, you know, I, of course, I talk about myself. I want to get to know the people that are taking the class a little bit better, ask them, you know, what their experiences are. Do they believe in the paranormal? Do they not believe in the paranormal? And I just kind of, I try to give it an approach where I teach a little, and then I give examples that fit into that. And then I get the class involved, asking them if they have any, you know, experiences similar to that, if they have any questions, if it's equipment training, I actually give them the equipment so they can have hands-on training. And then once that classroom is done, then that's when we do an investigation. So that way they can practice what they've learned. Okay. I'm trying to see if this is a question Scott's making our comment, but I'll put it up because it's in all caps. It says, I found we get more results with basic stuff, no tech. Our thoughts are it's because spirit either don't understand tech, so therefore don't go near it, or they just don't care what you use. That's a good point. Mm -hmm. So, Nicola, the, um, that's we kind of covered that earlier, but I'll ask it and we'll get Heather to take to see. She's asking, how does witchcraft aid investigations? Um, it, it basically, the way I use it is to help empower the clients. Um, you give them the power to understand that not, there's nothing to be afraid of. Um, 
And then also just different, you know, my investigative tools include um, pendulum boards, pendulums, um, you know, dousing rods, all the basic techniques. And then, of course, the protection aspect of it comes from herbs and crystals. And, of course, the power of believing in yourself. So the last question I came up with, I'm sure you get asked all the time is, are there any locations you wish you could investigate? I, I do. I've, I've visited um, Williamsburg several times, but I never investigated there. So I would just love, you know, anywhere in Williamsburg or Charleston are some of my favorite places to investigate or to that I want to investigate. I, they're my favorite places to visit, but I just want to get there and actually do an investigation. Right. And so I came up with, because I know you get asked this a lot, a twist to the question that you probably don't get asked a lot. Are there any locations that are calling or drawing you to them that you want to investigate? I would say there's two. One is the Sydney Opera House. I've always been interested in Australia and just the history. I would just love to get into that building. <laughs> and, and I think it might be more or less just a fascination with it, but it could be something calling me to do it. But there's a small fishing village, probably about an hour from where I live. It's called John's Pass at um, near Treasure Island. And it has such a history. Um, it has everything from Confederate soldiers have been spotted there, um, you know, pirates, and it's just this cute, I mean, it's a cute little town and we go and visit that often. And I think it's because when I'm there, I feel like I'm home. Something just feels comfortable. And I haven't investigated there yet just because there's no locations that do investigations out there. But, you know, keep your, keep your fingers crossed. I've been reaching out to several people out there in the hopes of doing some type of ghost tour. Yeah. Sorry, folks. I'm just laughing because... My two dogs just heard somebody's dog bark. <laughs> yeah, and they dog. ran outside and they're like desperately <laughs> hunting where this bark came from. Yeah. <laughs> um, what I was going to ask you, Heather, is obviously, do you believe in past lives and stuff like that? I do. I do. And even though I haven't dug deep into it yet, I do. Um, I do personally believe that my past life would have been the Civil War era right. because I have a big fascination with that. And I love I mean, I was born in Virginia, mm -hmm. um, love everything to do with the Civil War. And, and I know that sounds tragic because it was such a horrific event that happened here in the U.S. But, you know, everything from Gettysburg, Williamsburg, Harrisburg, you know, Atlanta. And um, one of the things that I'm writing my next book after I finish this one I'm doing is Haunted Civil War Sites of Florida. Wow. And just digging into the research of that and how active Florida was in the Civil War. And I do believe that my fascination has to be connected. And I've had several dreams of myself living in that time frame. Yeah. 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 And it's interesting you talk about Florida with the Civil War because studying it, I don't recall really any mention of any battles or major conflicts. Mm-hmm during the civil war in florida i'm like i know georgia then they went to the carolinas and there was mississippi texas louisiana i think had a couple but it's like florida is like everyone kind of forgets they were part of the csa and like yep. nobody really thinks about them and it's yeah. interesting because yeah I, i'm sure there were but mm -hmm. Yeah, the book I just finished is, uh, or will be finishing tomorrow, I'm editing it tonight, is um, Haunted Florida Lighthouses. And that's what got me the idea for the other book, because like Key West, Key West was actually um, a major point in the Civil War, because the Confederates was trying to prevent the Union's, Union Navy from taking it over, and they actually lost it to the Union. So the Florida Keys were part of the Union during all of that. And then Tampa Bay was the site of several wars because or several battles because they were trying to come in through Tampa Bay. And even though they had removed all the lights from the lighthouses throughout Florida during that time, there was still several battles trying to keep them away from making it on the shore. Yeah. And not to steal a phrase from the, my friends in the UK, but 
That's pretty cheeky to take the lights out of the lighthouses. <laughs> they did. <laughs> but um, so I, I know you're not really an expert on, or I don't think anybody's really an expert in the paranormal, but with your background, if say I was to say to you, I went to Vicksburg and I could see in front of me like a video of watching soldiers moving i could smell the gunpowder i could smell the blood it's like i could see the whole battle unfolding right before my eyes mm -hmm. as if i was immersed in it would you call that a past life experience it, it could be um, but if you're actually on the street, it could be one of two things. Um, just when you were sharing the story, it was, um, I was thinking it could either be residual energy that you're picking up on and you're very sensitive to the land and surroundings around you, or it could be a time slip to where you actually slip back in time. Because I know there was um, one of the Uni University of Gettysburg or Gettysburg College, they have a building and several students who have gone into the basement when the doors open from the elevator, they are met with a horrific scene of a Civil War um, hospital. And they oh. said they could hear the men screaming and see blood, smell blood. And then when they close the doors, go back upstairs to get someone to come downstairs, they go back downstairs and it would be just a storage room. And oh. that has been referred to as a, a time slip. Interesting. Oh, I like the thought of that. I can travel through time. <laughs> 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 that's pretty cool i never thought about it as a time slip but mm. it could be it was more like a memory and that's why i was curious but um so we've reached our hour point and we do have one question if you want to take it on and then finish or do you need to go no i'm good I... <laughs> okay kel how about you yeah, that's fine. Okay, well, Scott says, do you think spirit miss contact in locations that don't get investigated often or in places where they have got to know you? I think so. I, I truly do. Like the one story I shared earlier where the spirit came to our house, but then also um, Gold Point. I had mentioned that we investigated there. And this, um, you, you, it's on trying to remember it's between Vegas and Goldfield, but it's still a good two and a half to three hours away from Vegas because once you get off the main highway, it's an hour road down a one way dirt road to get to gold point. And um, we decided to set up and do a spirit box session underneath the hangman's news. And we were expecting to get, you know, cries and wails and, you know, a whole bunch of things related to the actual artifact. But instead we had several different voices, male and female, hello, hi, hello, how are you? Hi. And it was like, they just kind of flocked to us and we're like, Ooh, somebody's here and wants to talk to us. <laughs> so, so I do feel as long as it's not over investigated and as many times as he gets guests out there that actually want to do investigations, they've probably had that taste of what it's like to talk to somebody after being isolated. And then it could go months before someone else comes out to talk to them. Hmm. Interesting. So interesting question, because you talk about over investigation. What is a good number for teams, do you think, to work with that they should, in your opinion, have like member wise, like four, 10, 15? <laughs> I, I think it all depends on what your plan is as a team. If you're planning on just doing locations you know like if you're going to go to old jails and you know cemeteries and just do the research you can have as many as you want you know however many you feel could do the research if you're planning on helping clients you want to make sure that i would say anywhere from six to eight because you want to make sure that you have enough for two teams to go investigate if you have two clients at the same time but for us i mean it's just the three of us and we're, we're quite happy. I, I always joke that I know they're trained right, so I know who I'm working with because <laughs> I train them. <laughs> yeah. and, and they have no, uh, no um, input elsewhere. 
because they weren't on other teams before I, you know, I started training them. Cool. Any other questions, Michael? Uh, I actually asked all that I came up with. <laughs> I know I've let you draw all the way tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Just sat here and be quiet, as usual. Um, <laughs> that's all really I, I can think about to ask. Um, one thing is, do you think um, ghosts fade over time? That's a theory that I've been trying to figure out because it goes back to, I know some people have seen different things, but why don't we see ghosts of cavemen? Why don't mm. we see ghosts of dinosaurs? Yeah. You know, why don't, why are most of the spirits that we see from the 17th and 18th century? You know, how come there's yeah. not, I mean, and I know some people have seen Roman soldiers, you know, and stuff like that, but it's not as often. Yeah. So it's like, why are we not seeing, you know, similar to a VHS tape or a yeah. cassette player? If you play the, your favorite song over and over and over, you know, eventually that song's going to start losing quality. Yeah. It's um, the, like the way, the way we see it is that basically you've got a ghost who is technically called the light, the white lady or something like that. There's nothing to say that years ago that she wasn't the red lady. Like mm -hmm. a dress might have faded over time, like every time you keep seeing right. her. And... Yep. Or she could have changed clothes. <laughs> Possibly. Yeah, yeah that, that's what I want to learn is how do spirits determine what they're wearing? Mm. <laughs> is it not what they're dying? I don't know. Is it? <laughs> I don't think so because... Or what they were happy with. When you think about it, I know of a few mediums that when they, when they say they channel or doing their trance state that they see the individual in like clothes they may have died in their 80s but they see him as a teenager or a young mm -hmm. adult and so i kind of feel like they choose how they want to appear and i think they look at who their audience is and say how will these people know me if I, yeah. you know this person was to describe me how would they automatically know and if the, you go to somebody who only knew him in their 80s and go, oh, well, he's wearing jeans, rolled up sleeves like he's in the 50s. And they're like, I don't have, have a clue. I've never seen anybody like that. But then they go, well, he's in this like checkered shirt and jeans. He's like, oh, that's like my grandfather. And well, if so, you think uh, about it, um, like it couldn't really be what the dying because the, the amount of people have must have died naked. And you never really see a naked ghost here. Mm. So no, uh, I don't think they care what they're buried in. To be honest, hmm. I think that's more for us. We want them to look nice going into the ground. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. I mean, let's be honest. You you know people who you always seen them in like tattered t shirts, torn jeans. You go to their funeral and they're like in a suit. Mm -hmm. It's like, how is this what this person would have picked to be buried in? <laughs> <laughs> hey, any more questions? Sorry. Um, I don't have any more questions offhand. No, neither do um, I. And we've gone over a little bit anyway, so um well, actually so, one question on Heather is how can people find you? Oh, um, you can find me <laughs> on Facebook. Um, I'm at Dr. Heather Lee. Um, or you can, my team at Exploration Paranormal. Uh, you can also find me at Exploring the Paranormal Show to get access to my Tuesday show or Ghost Education 101. And then we also have our uh, website, which is explorationparanormal.com or heatherleephd.com. Excellent. And you mentioned you're on the Paralinks Network, right? Yes. So yep, are for, we. For Ghost Ed. Yeah. Oh, we what? just Ghost Education. <laughs> we aired last night. Um. Brilliant. Right. Um, well, I just want to say thank you very much, Heather, for coming on. It's been very interesting. And um, like I say, I, I'm, I would like to find out a little bit more about you, um, if that's okay. Um, Feel free to reach out anytime. 
Um, no problem. Um, and I want to thank Michael for asking all the questions tonight. Uh, you're <laughs> Again, welcome. Second week in a row. <laughs> uh, it's good uh, practice for me. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I just want to thank everybody that's been watching also. Um, if anybody has any questions, they can either go in touch with myself or Michael or directly with Heather herself. Um, but thank you very much. Who we got on next time? Can you remember, Michael? Uh, next week, or not next week, in a couple of weeks, Two we weeks. will be with Kenneth Torres. Ooh, Kenneth I Torres. love Kenneth. <laughs> He's a great guy. Yeah. Ooh, so, any dirt you want to spill? Uh, off the air. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I, I just want to, like I say, thanks to everybody who's um, asked questions, and especially Scott. Um, I mean, Scott's going to be doing another podcast about history. So I just plug that when he's feeling a bit better anyway. So it yeah. Um it's been a brilliant show anyway. So I just want to thank everybody and Michael, have you got anything that you want to add? Um, I just wanna thank everyone that was in the chat group and um yeah, and for all the questions and thank you for coming on our show. Thank you for having me. Thank you. And thank you, Kel, for you know allowing me to co-host with you yet again. You mean for letting you do all the work again? <laughs> <laughs> I prefer the term co-host. Okay. <laughs> we call it you lucky in the UK. You me lucky. I'm your girlfriend. I'm joking. We we'll love you really. I love you too. <laughs> uh, do you want to close right. up there, Michael? All right. Well, I would say thank you to everybody. It's been a fun show. It's been a great time. So if you're going to be investigating this weekend, have fun, be safe, and remember to always catch and review what you document. Have a great one, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.